Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about holistic nutrition. It's one of my passions for many years in my life. Uh, as Angie said, I've been in this business a very, very long time. There's me and my very first dog looking so young and fresh um, when I started Sojourner Farms many, many years ago. And um, of course, today things are quite different. I'm a little older, I've got the gray hair now, but I'm still just as passionate about nutrition and the power of medicine to heal. The power of food to be thy medicine is what I want to say. To me, they're interchangeable. So let's just dive right into this. This is a really important lesson that I think a lot of us need to learn. Okay, what is real food? So most sensible people would agree that eating minimally processed foods is the healthier option over foods that are overly cooked and overly heavily adulterated, right? So chicken meal is a great example of this because in the pet food industry, it is used an awful lot. It is not just dehydrated chicken. It's cooked. The carcasses are, first of all, very, very softened in acid and then cooked at high heat and pressure. And what's left is there's no life in it. There's certainly no energy in it and certainly no nutrition in it. So it's very different from real chicken meat. Chicken nuggets are not the same. Um, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're convenient, they're easy, they're tasty, I'm not gonna lie, but they're not as healthy. So we know this, right? But this doesn't keep us from eating stuff that isn't so good for us and feeding it to our animals. So today what we're gonna focus on is how can a healthy diet be our medicine? What is the science behind it? And I'm going to take you through a little bit of chemistry today, a little bit of biochemistry. Bear with me. It's not difficult. Okay. It's very important though. So let's admit for some reason in North America, we still tend to think that no matter where we get our vitamins and minerals, they're all the same. If you take a nutritional supplement or if you eat, um, food with a vitamin premix in it. And just about every breakfast cereal has that. Vitamins are vitamins, not true. We're gonna talk about that today a lot. Synthetic vitamins, most vitamins found in processed food are actually made in a lab. They don't come from nature. Um, and they have to add these supplements to most processed foods in order to meet nutrition standards, minimum nutrition standards. And um, we're gonna take a little bit closer look at that later too. It's no different for people food. Like I said, um, most folks, when I was in practice as a practitioner, I would have to beg people to lay off the multivitamin and eat a good breakfast instead. That's how you get your nutrition. It's no different for people food. So I don't want to, I don't want to pick on pet food industries, but do you honestly think that the, the nutrition, the vitamin and mineral mix in the, the box of Fruity Loops is actually going to give you your hundred percent? daily? No. So what is a vitamin premix? It's a custom ordered batch of synthetic nutrients, right? It's made in a lab and these synthetic nutrients are combined at a specific ratio that pet food companies can then dump into their extruders um, to boost the levels of vi my vitamins and minerals and nutrition, like I said, that are legally required. It's not real food by any stretch. It's powdery, dusty stuff, usually made offshore. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what's in it. So what we've got are isolated minerals, calcium carbonate, limestone, chalk. It's used in the manufacturing of all kinds of plastics and ceramics. We've got, for another example, magnesium chloride. It's processed with hydrochloric acid. It's used to fireproof wood, et cetera, zinc sulfate. These are all very common in pet foods, are very common in people food too. Um, what happens is that every day our companion animals are fed these gluconates, oxides, picolinates, phosphates, all this stuff. And after a long period of time, these consumptions can cause toxic accumulation, right? And the body's elimination system is easily overtaxed and it works harder than to remove these inorganic compounds and it stresses the organs of detoxification, like the kidneys. Okay, isolated proteins are no better. 
pea protein is a really good example. This has been at the root of a bunch of concerns about DCM in the last year when some companies were uh, taking out the grain and not adding enough meat and they were using a lot of pea protein and it was creating a lot of problems with a lot of dogs. So just like mineral and vitamin manufacturing, the same can be said for these isolated proteins. They go through a chemical process in order for manufacturers to isolate just the protein, right? From the plant or the meat. And you're not getting a whole food. It's very much like making chicken meal. So that's not so good either. I want to talk to you a little bit about what happens when you actually have these isolated nutrients. You set up a process in the body, not every time, but this is a real risk of metabolic acidosis. This is a great little chart here showing pH. I'm not going to get into the, all the chemistry about pH, but metabolic acidosis it's, it's total metabolic uh, acidosis. Actually, it's a shutdown. It wastes your muscle and your bone tissues. It creates cellular congestion um, and increased vulnerability to degenerative diseases. That's what cancer is. That's what autoimmune diseases are. It's common knowledge now um, that I know this is a little aside, but cancer cells can't survive in an alkaline environment. They just die, but they do thrive in an acidic environment. So what I'm saying is these overprocessed protein isolates are creating that dreaded over acidic environment that is so bad for your body. And in addition to the body having a harder time assimilating these isolated proteins, they are extracted by they the when they are extracted, they remove the fat and the fiber from these proteins. And that it takes out phospholipids. The phospholipid bilayer of the cell is super important to the health of every cell. I could go on and on. I promised you I wouldn't do too much chemistry, but get me talking about chemistry and I get pretty excited. And trust me, the body does not need any more encouragement for metabolic acidosis because we get enough of it from stress and pollution. Metabolic acidosis is a real, real issue. So when you strip all these nutrients out of their natural state and create them in labs or strip them from the meat or the, pro, the, the, the vegetables. What, it's a very inefficient process. And in order for the body to make use of all these synthetic supplements and isolated nutrients, it has to find the missing vital components elsewhere in the tissues of the body, right? And the body is very good at this, but at some point, it's very, very tiring for the body to do it, right? So think about it. So the body has to determine which synergistic factors are missing in the adulterated foodstuffs. And then those components have to be obtained from the body's stored supplies elsewhere in the body. And that means that these synthetic nutrients, which in and of themselves are not terrible for the body, they have to be put on hold, usually stored in the fat, until the body can then determine if the missing micronutrients that are needed in order to make that synthetic nutrient work in the body, in order to absorb it and metabolize it, has to find those missing micronutrients and then convert the synthetic nutrient into a usable form. It's taxing, it's inefficient, and the body is really good at doing this, but it does get tired of it. And what happens is, um, it's like the body becomes so tired of it. It's like it's running on a hamster wheel. I love this visual. It's running on a hamster wheel and that leads to chronic health problems. So as these intrinsic co-nutrients are depleted and then they don't get replenished in the body, the this prolonged exposure to these one-dimensional synthetic supplements causes the body to just Either, either collapse, the immune system collapses, the muscle system collapses, something, it, it, it's not sustainable. So um, the body's detox system is the biggest system that takes the biggest hit from this chronic oversupply of the synthetic nutrients that then cannot be metabolized properly. The kidneys, the skin, we're going to see how this comes out on the skin, but all the body's detox systems get extremely stressed, right? And then illness is inevitable, right? Um, it seems kind of backward, doesn't it? Because food is supposed to actually make you healthier instead of make you sick. 
So the word for these synthetic nutrients is xenobiotic nutrient analogs. Love the word. But that's xenobiotic means foreign. The body sees these synthetic nutrients as foreigners. They are chemically and structurally different from those that are found in food, those that are found in nature with all of their, their synergistic micronutrients. We don't even know what all these micronutrients are. Like we don't know the names of science has not been able to determine in a carrot. We know there's vitamin A, but where in beta carotene? What about all the other little tiny micronutrients that are required for the body to absorb that beta carotene and vitamin A? Where are those? What are the names? We don't really know. It's a fascinating field, actually. If I was 20 or 30 years younger, I might go into it. <laughs> so xenobiotic nutrient analogs behave differently than the native nutrients. And a good example of that is petroleum extracts, right? This is not food. The body does not see this as food. So what happens? So when animals consume these chemical foodstuffs, their whole immune system is compromised as the body tries to determine what to do with these unrecognizable substances. I really like this image. This is the, an immune system that is sending out signals to cells saying, red alert, red alert, you know, what is this stuff, right? I think this is one of the, the, maybe it's one of the reasons why so many dogs are diagnosed with being allergic to different foods, right? In fact, I don't think they're allergic at all, but they're sensitized to the chemicals added to and around the different proteins in their food and their immune systems are reacting accordingly. So this immune response to foreign invaders distracts the immune system from all the really important work, like killing cancer cells. Like I said, the body gets really tired. It's bad news. I love this chart to underscore my point. So this is a chart about the interrelationship just of minerals in animals. You cannot affect one mineral without it affecting two others. Minerals need each other in order to be metabolized and useful to the body. This is an interrelationship. So one mineral is affecting two other minerals and it's like a series of intermeshing gears. And like I said, we don't even know the names of all the little intermeshing gears that are in whole foods, but we do know they are missing from substances that are made in labs, right? I love this. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to soil, right? You might be asking, how does the body get minerals in the right ratio from real food? I thought you'd never ask. It's from the soil. Soil is so important to protect in this world. We get minerals from rocks. We don't eat rocks. Dogs don't eat rocks. Rocks break down into soil. Soil holds the plants. It grows the plants. The plants absorb the minerals through a very complex, beautiful soil system, which is worth studying in and of itself. These mineral-rich plants then get eaten by animals that eat other that that get eaten by other animals it's called the food chain people it's as old as time it's the best way to eat it's how we get our minerals naturally you don't need them synthetically you eat plants you eat animals that eat plants that's what we do it's so important to protect our soil and now here's a perfect food give you an example of one food that has it all, it's the egg. All the egg, the egg has everything. It has protein, it has, it has all the family of co-nutrients that it was born with, so to speak, right? Because nutrients that are left intact and integrated will retain their functional integrity. They will be absorbable. They will be seen by the body as nutrients, their micronutrients, their co-family of nutrients that are naturally around them are all fully present. I like to tell my daughter who's trying to put on a little weight that a whole egg, which is about 100 calories, is a, is a whole meal. Two eggs in the morning, hard boiled eggs, no salt, no fat. If you're into that, 
that's a perfect food. It's a perfect food for most animals, actually. And interestingly enough, food scientists have not been able to synthetically recreate an egg. That's how complex it is. So whole food nutrients, to sum up this part, they exist in their physical chemical forms that the body recognizes. They contain all their nutrient cofactors that affect bioavailability, which is the ability of the body to absorb and use that nutrition. And they serve multiple roles as building blocks of health, right? The body can see them. The body can use them. It knows what to do. It's efficient. So the takeaway message at this point is to remember the animal's body, and you're an animal too, digests and metabolizes food, not nutrients. So you got to think about the source of the nutrients when you're looking at what you're going to feed your animal, right? And of course, whole food is the best medicine. So let's talk a little bit about the medicine part, because this is where we get into a little bit more of the, the whole science, right? So the natural immune response to these xenobiotic agents we just discussed, in my opinion, has led to this phenomenon where so many of these animals are allergic to stuff. This is a list of a whole bunch of things that I have talked to consumers over my time in this industry, which is, wow, over 30 years, that animals are supposedly allergic to. There's nothing on this list that is bad for you peanut butter, rice, peas, beef, right? Why would an animal whose DNA is, is biologically programmed it to eat meat, why would it be allergic to chicken? That never made any sense to me until I started looking into the other foods that our animals are being fed, that they're eating, that might be surrounding this issue. So let's, let me talk to you just a little bit about what I mean here. Now, this is a little bit, bear with me, okay? It's a little bit of chemistry, but it's not too bad, okay? So here's a technical explanation of the allergic response. This is known as an immune response. So this here is a mast cell. I got to remember which way I'm pointing here. There we go. <laughs> That's a mast cell, right? The body has certain white blood cells whose job it is to patrol for invaders. They go through the bloodstream. Very smart. Anything that's foreign, the mast cells, the basophils, that's another one. So when an allergen, anything that's foreign is, is seen, it enters the immune system, the mast cell goes on high alert. It goes on notice. It starts looking around, prepping, if you will, for an assault on the body, right? It creates IgE receptors, which are these receptors on the outside of the cell. And when the IgE receptors bind to that allergen or that pathogen or that foreign invader, a, a, a reaction is then is then triggered that creates an immune response in the body, okay? And this inflammatory response creates chemicals. Histamine is one of the most known. We understand histamine reactions, right? Benadryl is a form of histamine that we take if we have a facial uh, flare-up, if we get stung, or if we eat something that causes our lip to swell, right? This is an immune response. It's an allergic response. So, and it's caused by degranulation. The mast cells release these chemicals. And then these granules, histamine is one of the most well-known one causes. It causes itching if it's released in the skin. It causes wheezing if it's release, released in the lungs. And it can cause anaphylactic shock if it's released, released system-wide in the body. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And this is also going to tell the body to release more IgE, so you can have a continual response depending on if that allergen is, if there's a lot of it in the system, you might have a serious systemic response and that could cause a whole lot of trouble. That is a technical explanation. Now, further, there are phases of the immune response, right? It's not just a, a single one and done. So once the mast cells or the basophils have released their chemicals, the allergic reaction occurs quickly, and that's called the immediate reaction. So you're seeing an immediate reaction. Um, like I said, if your dog gets stung by a bee, my dog once got stung by a bee on the face and his basketball-sized head got even bigger. Scared the heck out of me, but I used uh, 
I used some really great little homeopathic remedies that took that swelling right down before we even got to the vet. You always take your dog to the vet when something like that happens. But I had to happen to have remedies on me, so I, I managed it. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> anyway, so there's also late phase reactions, right? And so if your dog has got swelling of a hawk or some other kind of consistent chronic swelling that seems to happen, that could also be part of an immune response to what your animal is eating. And it's more of a late phase immune response, right? Your, your animal's constantly going through this process. That's chronic inflammation, right? Even if it's happening on the leg, it could be for their food, from their food. It could be. Symptoms, chronic ear inflammation, all that paw biting, the licking of the paws, hot spots. These seem random, but they're actually, the, they can be signs of food intolerance, right? And they're not always digestive. A lot of times we think my dog ate something they're allergic to or they're, they're not really comfortable with. And so they've got gas. Yep, that could be it. They've got a digestion issue. The stools are off. Yep, that could be it too. But it also could be itchy ears. I have seen many, many animals get really right out of that whole itchy ears, licking paws thing, just from a change of diet. And their owners were really quite surprised at that because they're thinking, mm, that's not digestive. No, it's not. It's an immune response, right? It's all part of the immune response. Chronic inflammation is a long long phase immune response. This is what's going on with your animal, right? It's an endless cycle of constant producing of IgE antibodies and the, all the other enzymes and chemicals and causes therefore continuous, immediate and late phase symptoms of inflammation. Chronic inflammation, as most of us know, is at the root of so many autoimmune diseases, cancer and arthritis all kinds of things that are too numerous to mention, even Alzheimer's. Like there's a lot of work being done now to sort of study the roots of mental illness and, and, and cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's and chronic inflammation seems to be a centerpiece of that. So this is uh, also to underscore how important it actually is to look at the diet and find out is the diet possibly creating this? What is in the diet that might be creating this hamster wheel of chronically trying to rid the body, detox the body of xenobiotic analog synthetic stuff that the body's like, I don't have any information in my DNA about what this stuff is. Why is it in here? We got to get it out. So you've got this chronic inflammation going, right? It does make it hard to tell what's really affecting the animal if you're, if you're not aware that diet could actually be at the very center of it. So here's, here's a huge, hugely important. This, my friends, is how chronic illness gets a foothold in the body. Hugely important slide, okay? The destruction of the gut. This is a little microsection of the small intestine. This is where nutrients are absorbed. So what you're seeing here are the villi, which they're like little sea anemones all along the lining of the small intestine. So when the food goes from the stomach into the small intestine, it's been very well digested. Now it's really tiny particles and the villi are absorbing all these nutrients. And when they're healthy, like I said, they're like sea anemones, they look like this, but when they're not healthy, they are stiff or flat. And then you've got destruction of the gut, right? Villus atrophy, instead of like this, they're like this and they're stiff and they're tight. This process happens when the lining of the gut has been so bombarded by foods that are deemed foreign. There's constant inflammation here. The villi are tiny, tiny, tiny little creatures there <laughs> and they do not survive that very well they get flat, they get stiff, they're not able to absorb nutrients. What happens when your body's not able to absorb nutrients? You get, you get unhealthy. Everything goes to hell in a handbasket, as grandma used to say. You get leaky gut. Leaky gut, I won't, I won't I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to get too technical about this, but 
the cells of the in small intestine are literally the small intestine lining is one cell thick. So if you've got trouble absorbing the nutrients in your small intestine, you're going to have you're going to have these these villi that are not functioning properly. You're going to actually have big molecules, two big molecules going directly into the bloodstream. That's the long and the short of it. They go through directly into the bloodstream because the spaces in between the cells, these tight junctions are no longer tight. It's like bricks in an old wall. They start to crack and separate. And this is supposed to preserve the integrity of the bloodstream. And it isn't able to do that anymore. So you get these synthetics, you get these pre-digested but not quite fully digested particles going into the system. You get chemicals going directly into the bloodstream. And this is the beginning of autoimmune diseases and all kinds of destruction of the body. Leaky gut is a terrible, terrible thing. It happens all over the place. And here, even more so, one of the, the biggest, biggest reasons that this causes all these allergic reactions is because 70% of the immune system is in the small intestine. 70% of the immune system. So there's this, there's this white blood cell, it's called secretory IgA. And secretory IgA is one of the most abundant antibodies in the system. And it kills pathogens that come in contact with mucosal tissue. What is mucosal tissue? Every outer focused opening of the body has mucosal tissue the eyes, the mouth, the nose. Think about it. Anything that the world could get into the body through is lined with mucosal tissue, which is protected by secretory IgA. Secretory IgA is made in the small intestine. If your small intestine or if your dog's small intestine is not working properly, it's not going to be able to make secretory IgA. Your dog is going to get all kinds of urinary infections, digestive problems, breathing problems. You see where this is going? Chronic inflammation looks an awful lot like an allergic reaction, remember? It affects every organ of the body. Reduced immunity is terrible. Frequent infections that become long-term. And then you're so far from the idea that it's caused by the diet because now your dog's been diagnosed with all kinds of other stuff that you're thinking, how does this have anything to do with the diet? It has everything to do with the diet or it could have everything to do with the diet. Everybody's different, every dog is different, but you absolutely have to go back to what is the animal eating in order to wrap up that puzzle and get anywhere. Yep, at this point, when you've got all kinds of organ destruction, you're gonna have to start there, try to make the animal feel better, stop the destruction, you know, your vet will have the answers to that. But if you can go back to the diet, trace your steps back, you will then be able to see the power of food to heal the body. It does take time. It's not overnight. So you have to remove the chemicals and the synthetics from the diet right off the top. If my dog is diagnosed with anything or if I'm diagnosed with anything, first thing I'm going to think of is, okay, whole foods fresh table grade meats, fresh or table grades. We can't all feed fresh meat. I'm going to acknowledge that right there. It's expensive. It's a it take different set of rhythms in your household to do it. You don't have to do that. There are products on the market that you can feed that have that quality of meat, but it's just not fresh. No extruded foods. We talked about what happens to them. There's no nutrition in that. After all the high heat, the pressure, the acid, there's nothing in there. There's no life in there. And it's certainly not a whole food. Take out the inedible foodstuffs. Anything that if you can't pronounce it, don't feed it. That's anything synthetic, right? What we're doing to wrap all this up, by feeding whole foods, we're cooling down the whole inflammatory system here. We're just cooling it right down. We're simplifying the job of the detox system so that it can now focus on dealing with the chronic problems that have come up. We're cooling things down, calming things down. I love to think of it that way. Take the heat out of it. Healing is possible, folks. By removing the sources of the inflammation before you resign yourself to the idea that your dog is allergic to everything, 
could change your life. It could change your animal's life. And that is the crux of the matter. Let food be thy medicine. Please just give it a try.